I've often thought about what would the perfect player look like. It might play the game in a completely different way from the way that we play it. As a chess player, you want to know more about chess, you want to get deeper, and there is so much still to learn. Alpha Zero played a match against Stockfish, which was the strongest computer that we all knew, and it won the match. And all of a sudden I thought, wow, you know. Does this really work? How does it know how to do it? I started thinking, oh, it's quite interesting, quite interesting. And there's just a couple of games that went bang. And these were very exciting games, very attacking games, giving pawns away right at the early stages of the game. The other computers were thinking, well, that's too early. Alpha Zero doesn't have any rules. It learns through experience. I really didn't think there was room for this huge attacking style, yeah. you know, never in my wildest dreams. Yeah. There's even more depth than we thought in chess. It's like discovering the secret notebooks of some great player from the past. It explains Alpha Zero's strategies. How does Alpha Zero think? Alpha Zero blows apart what traditional engines are doing. Hello everyone and welcome to this stream and uh, this time we're looking taking our first look at a number of events the seniors under 65s the under 50s the That'll be the open. over 65s and the over Oh 50s. I'm sorry over 65s <laughs> over 50s um, indeed Yes and the under 2000s um, the events we're doing. And uh, just to say, the over 65s tournament is in memory of Julian Farrand. There's a trophy in memory of Julian Farrand. And the under 2000s, uh, there's a trophy in memory of Nick Mitchum. Uh, so we want to feature those events. Um, and uh, also to say that the major open, which we will feature in um, one of our morning broadcasts, is uh, in memory of John Naylor. And these three guys were very popular in the chess world, uh, have been sad loss to the English chess world um, in the last year or so. And uh, so we want to remember them. Uh, we've got some good games lined up for you today. Um, in the um, over 50s, we will be looking at uh, Terry Chapman, who is going to be white on board two against Jonathan Hill. And on board one, we will follow the game David Walker, who is white against Rob Wilmoth. Uh, and also on board three, Clive Frostick against Tim Kett. Um, and board four, Remy Tayo against Alan Boozy. And uh, and those are the people who have uh, one out of one um, in the over 50s. Uh, so there should be some good struggles there. Uh, also in the over 50s, Julian Shepley, Philip Maybury, uh, George Miller and Paul Rabindra. Uh, George, Miller. George Miller, he was playing in the quali qualifications, wasn't he, I think? Um, I, I think that he was. Aardvark, T-Y-A. I think he didn't he draw a good game with um with uh, um Peter Saure in, ah, um, yes, in the qualifiers. Yes, yes. A Tarash, I think we looked at for quite a while there. So uh, Fine. yes, and he's on the, the black side against uh, Paul Rabindra. Um we in the over sixty five so this is round two. Um in the over sixty fives we have Pete Leonard against Dave Bray. We have George Green against Paul Kemp. Alan Gregg against Alan Borwell, the Battle of the Allens. And then we have Irish player Pete Morris against Brian Gosling. We have Tim Harding. Now, Tim Harding, is he the Irish player Tim Harding? I think there's a Tim Harding that's written a lot of books. So is that right? Absolutely. Is it the I same think, person? Yes. I think, I think it this is, is the Tim Harding author. indeed. Yeah. Tim, Tim Harding, um, well known author against Ed Goodwin. Uh, Michael Marshall against. Jeff Stewart and Pat Twomey against Robert Smart. Uh, so a lot of action lined up in the over 65s. Some very experienced players here. Um, and then in the under 2000s, uh, we've got how many boards in the under? Uh, 26 boards in the uh, over 2000s, sorry, under 2000s, let's get it right. Um, and, and some of these names you might recognize from our other sessions. Um, and we also have some young players. So 
um, for example, Harry Zheng um, on board six. Um, we'll be following various various games throughout uh, this section. Kate Walker is there, uh, who was playing in the women's event. Um, Emils Steiners, who Matthew knows better oh, as Speed yeah. Elephant, is, uh, is, is playing as well. So, so the, a few names that we recognise to follow there. And Ian Lamb as well. Yeah, Emil Steiners, he was the, the nine-year-old Lapian. Uh, wasn't exactly it? right. Uh, yes. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Played uh, some pretty nice games, actually. So uh, ah, that would be interesting to uh, to see. So, uh, yeah, indeed, prolific author. I think... I think I've read a book of his very recently on uh, on Steinitz's time in uh, in London, Tim Harding. So, um, oh, I'm going to be interested to see him play there. That's uh, that's very interesting. Read a number of books by him in the past as well. Opening books on uh, one e four e five openings. You see, Mark, you're if you're over sixty five and under two thousand, you could try and simul these games and and play two at once. Um, which which would be good going. I thought that, uh, last night when I was putting all the, the um, pairings together, I thought Harry Zhang, Zheng was simulating the um, major open and the under 2000s, but actually they're at different times of day. So uh, there's, there's actually a few people that are playing in the morning and the afternoon and the evening. Um, yeah. So they, 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 uh, they love their chess and we will try and follow some of these players that are playing in more than one event at once. I don't. I don't know of anyone that's playing it really more at more than one event exactly at once. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's is it possible because uh, I think you're only allowed to log in once to chess.com. So uh, I think you'd have to play with. Uh, you couldn't do it with, with different illegal usernames. Well, yes. I, don't, I, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think it would be no, possible. But, I don't uh, think it'd be wise. <laughs> it would also be quite tricky. Yeah. No. It's, uh... <laughs> well, you know, when you play in the um, in the Mind Sports Olympiad, they're all doing it. They just simulate all these games. Like like yeah, it's not true. just two. You know, it's like three different games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had we had one guy uh, who was really he was really chuffed because he came um, he got uh, I think two out of five in the shogi because he was also playing a backgammon tournament at the same time. So uh, he was really he was really hyped about his performance about <laughs> playing all those different uh, those different games at the same time. It's uh, I, I don't quite know how you do that to be honest, but uh, it was uh, no quite funny. Online uh, online playing like this gives you a lot of possibilities that you don't quite. Although wasn't it? Um, I remember that when we would talk to Demis and he was talking about the minor sports olympiad in the old days um he said that he was playing several games at once it was over the board but uh he was yeah. running from uh, running from, from, uh room to room. From, from room to room playing the games at the same time trying to get the maximum number of points the demis asabis uh, ceo of deep mind of course uh, uh responsible for alpha zero and some amazing that set him up hasn't it for his uh, his busy exactly. business business lifestyle so uh, a exactly yeah. i mean yeah when, whenever we met him he was always doing Make a, each meeting a, count yeah, always doing a million things. Oh, oh Mickey Adams has done it. There you go. You see, it's it's good training. It, it is all possible. It's it's all possible. Ah, but, very uh, good. Um, let's have a look. It's two minutes two. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen. So okay. um, just let me know as soon as that pops up. Um, application window, chess.com. And I'm going to, there we are, put it up. And let's do a little, there we are. I'll just uh, take my name off there, which is getting in the way. And I think we're good to go. Um, uh, let's have a look. Which which game do you want to, to start with, uh, Natasha? Let's start with the over 65s. How about oh. Pete Leonard against Dave Bray? Okay. It wasn't quite have started yet, but we'll uh, do that. I'll get my... Uh, my analysis board command at the ready, because we always need that. And uh... Ooh, if somebody's practicing the piano, Natasha. Oh, is that a bit noisy for you? I will. Before we start, I will. Uh... No, I mean, uh, if the you, you like the culture in the background. If the viewers don't mind, then um, then I'm absolutely yes. fine. Tell, with tell us if it gets too disturbing. It's my son. It's, uh... Was he? Uh, is is he? Uh, was he practicing grade eight actually? Piano. He yeah, he's done his grade seven, and uh, he intends to do his grade eight at some point. Though he hasn't quite okay. selected which pieces he wants to do. Okay, because um, they're, they're they're doing those online now, aren't they? All these exams. It's, oh, are uh, they? Oh, that's quite uh, convenient. Yeah. Well, my, my brother's uh, um, an examiner for, um, okay. for, for Trinity. He's getting massive, massive videos of um, of people, you know, doing their grade, uh, their grades. You can just like record the sound and then. 
<laughs> it's, it's got to be an actual video so it's got to be an actual video with everything and it's, it's got to be in one take as well so that uh, so that everyone knows uh, yeah, that, of um, course. And it's, yes. uh, it's real yes. Yes. but um but yeah yeah it's uh um, and that's true but that's that's different though isn't it because you could have three goes at it if it goes wrong the first time and have another yeah, you go. could you, you could of course but on the, on the other hand you know the exams are meant to show you at your best yeah you know, so um so from that point of view you know people do get very pressured in those uh in those music exams so yeah, it sounds yeah. quite it's quite a good idea really yeah uh, the, the one thing is i think the people who've got um you know good microphones and uh, good setups you know they do have an yeah. advantage but um but uh, yeah yeah anyway that's um all pretty good Oh, you studied music at university, uh, Mark. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, no, does Oscar? No, no. Oh, you did. Yeah. No, Oscar wants to study computer science um, at university. He, he likes maths and computer science. It must have been fun studying music, though. Are you, um, you did you, do you play, uh, play any instruments? It's, um, oh, so I just seem that. Because they say uh, maths and chess and music all go together. Indeed. Well, my brother's uh, my brother was a concert pianist. Actually, he studied mm. music at, uh, at Cambridge. So uh, for us, it was sort of uh, I did sort of uh, well it went together in the family. Although I didn't have any uh, particular musical talent myself, but um, it's uh, computer science is more useful. I think you're probably right. Certainly nowadays, um, I think uh, a huge number of exciting things are uh, they're all happening in the computer science world. Uh, mm. uh, composer, oh, composer. Wow. wow. Classical or um or or another genre. Ah, oh, this is nice. It was, it was good to know. Uh, mm. It's um just looking at um at uh, um Pete Leonard against David Bray. We had quite a few of these uh, games actually with the closed Sicilian um, keyboards and saxophone. Wow, oh, very Fantastic. nice. It's um, um, we have quite a few of these close Sicilians, and um, uh, but this one's being played in um, I think um, uh, a pretty good classical way. Bishop e three, Queen d two, very early. That means that after b five to b four, we can play the knight back to d one. So the knight can uh, uh, escape. Defending on b two. Yeah, White could defend, decide now um, what um, what to play. F four is a possibility. Um, knight e two is quite a common line as well. Um, Sometimes you throw in a three just to uh, to try and open up the a file, uh, but knight e two is a is a very common move. And here blacks would decide: um, um, Are you going to put a knight onto d four? You know, just to try and. Uh, um, oh, okay, fantastic, Mark. Oh, really nice to hear that. Um, so yeah, black uh, white might be. Uh, uh, it's interesting to see the different openings that they play in the seniors. So this is the over sixty fives event. And I'd say this is quite a quiet opening. Oh, it starts quiet. They're often these games get do get uh, attacking and tactical a bit later on, um, but they start a bit. You don't you don't necessarily need to know the exact move sequence um, quite so well as as a sharp Sicilian or something. Okay, that's uh, that's interesting. We'll uh, we'll keep a little eye on that. Let's um, let, let's go to the um, to the top boards of the over fifties just to uh, um, just get ourselves started. See what's uh, happening in there um david walker against rob wilmot uh, two very strong players actually um often encountered them in the uh, in the british championship proper as well um i played david walker many moons ago uh, mm. in the British championship um so um i think he was a c4 player then and he's a c4 player now um rob wilmot playing a fairly aggressive system with e5 and f5 so in general uh, you're expecting white to uh, advance on the queen side and black to um, uh, to go to the um, king side there with queen e8 to h5. Um, that's pretty exciting stuff. Uh, we're going to see what uh, what happens there. Um, let's have a look at um, uh, Michael Douglas against Hideous Hog. <laughs> I don't know whether you can guess who uh, those people are, but. Uh, um, well, hideous hog is a bridge reference, I guess. Uh, um, they, haven't, they haven't started yet, in actual fact. So uh, uh, okay, so Michael Douglas is Terry Chapman. Hideous hog, Jonathan Hill. But there's a very famous um, bridge book where the the hideous hog uh, hogs all the bidding, and uh, and so so I, I'm guessing then that Jonathan Hill is also a bridge player as well as a chess player. 
Um, Clive Frostick against Tim Kett. Now, Tim, I think was originally going to play in the uh, in the or was down to play in the uh, in the championship actually, but uh, um, I think then switched to um, uh, to the seniors. And uh, yeah, he's black against Clive Frostick, and this is um, a very solid um, four nights um, uh, scotch. Magnus Carlsen said that he always played this if he didn't want to lose as white. So uh, it's extremely solid. Not easy for um, for white to make something of it, mm. uh, for black to make something uh, of it, and well, also not so easy for white to make something of it either. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what um, what uh, um, uh, how both players approach it. I mean, white typically plays. Um, um, it's got several plans. I mean, um, queen to um, uh, to f three, and bishop to f four is one idea. Um, you can also um, uh, play queen to f3 and bishop to g5. And, yeah, uh, pin that knight and, and try and double the pawns. Take, maybe. take on f6. But I, I was, yeah, I never really feel these endings with the double pawns. You know, black's got the two bishops. I never really feel they're very much at all okay. for, um, for, uh, um, for white. But um, yeah, at some stage they, were, they, they came up with some plan of going um, knight to a4 and making something on c5, which was effective for a while. But was also, you know, also uh, neutralized in the end. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, just uh, quite, uh, um, quite a balanced position, and uh, we just have to uh, uh, see what uh, what happens there. Let's see. Has Michael Douglas started yet? <laughs> no, that hasn't started yet. So we'll uh, have a little look. Kerry should definitely be uh, up to speed on um, on the old chess.com stuff because we played. Uh, a pro biz tournament together, uh, London Classic, organised by uh, by Malcolm Payne and uh, the Chess and Schools uh, charity, and uh, it was all on chess.com, and uh, yeah, pretty much the same as this. We'll see if he sticks with whatever you showed him. Did you um, teach him some new openings? Uh, no, he taught me his openings actually, and uh, and we tried to play those. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I grasp them too successfully. They're completely different to the ones I play, but um, um, we sort of uh, we we got through in the end. He he just ignored what I was uh, the, the carnage I was inflicting on his openings, and then we uh, <laughs> we were generally quite successful afterwards. That was uh, it was very good fun, really nice uh, playing with someone. You know, partnership uh, play is not very common in uh, in chess. Of course, we did it in uh, Budapest. We did. We, played we did hand and brain. And brain. We we did pretty well. We we had a very good um, Mora gambit. Indeed. Who do we beat? We beat Arthur Kogan, the Grandmaster, and his wife, um, uh, who's, uh, I think she's a, she's a women's IM, isn't she? And uh, um, we won a, a great game there, and then had a great fight with um, a very strong pairing of um, uh, Yona Kosashvili, uh, the Israeli GM, and Sofia Polgar, his wife, who, of course, is uh, um, uh, extremely strong as well. And uh, we lost the uh, the Armageddon, didn't we? We, 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 did, uh, we did, but it was uh, it was a great fun, great event. Yeah. And uh, it, just in case you're wondering, Natasha was the brain, and I was the uh, I was the hand. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, as it as it should be. As it should be. I think it, I think it's English versus Dutch, uh, Mark. I um uh, I think if White plays C4, you can't really claim that you're uh, you're playing that it's a full Dutch, really. Um, because um I mean the Dutch normally is you know is played to um um is played to get control of e4, you know, when after you after you go d4. So uh I'd say it was uh, English versus uh, versus Dutch, I think. Um let's have a look. Who else could we have a look at? We've got um should we have a look at the under two thousands? We'll get um Yes. Um should we have a look at Harry Zheng? Let's do um, that. I yeah. say that because he's got a great uh, username. It's called... I know Lego <laughs> Children. <laughs> Lego Children. That's uh, against Bishop Raider. Ah, what a great! Uh... Wow, and, uh, and actually, um, what is happening here? My goodness me! Oh, Let's have a look at this opening. Oh, we <laughs> picked a good one. Um, e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, b4, Evans Gambit. That's what we like to see. <laughs> Pegs b4, c3, bishop a5, d4. Um, now, many different ways of playing against this. Um, now, I wonder whether um, whether uh, Harry, who's uh, who's a junior, really knows this because uh, you know this is quite an unusual and quite old, of course, the Evans Gambit. Um, although, I mean, obviously, uh, modern chess, you know, uh, <laughs> everyone plays everything, but uh, but still, 
Um, Graham can... Cole must have chosen the opening quite carefully. Graham was born in 1964, so Ooh, he, would, okay. he, he would know the traditional lines. So e takes d4, queen b3, queen e7. Um, and now something uh, quite shocking has happened. Uh, castles kingside, and now black plays bishop takes c3, knight takes c3, and knight a5. So temporary peace sacrifice with a fork of the queen and bishop. Um, now I would actually think that this is um, this is not going to be good for um, for black at all, but uh, it is definitely very high on the confusion factor. Yeah. So what can we do here? So um, is this is this a known line? I don't think so, um, because what I want to do is I, I want to go just queen b5, actually. Um, attack this knight, and after knight takes here, I want to go knight d5. Oh, threatening the queen and threatening a fork. Threatening the queen and threatening a fork. Now, I'm not sure I've done it right with the, quite right, putting the queen on, on c b5, because you've got a few confusing ideas. You could go c6 in this position. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, in all fairness, um, um, uh, simply going queen takes c4 takes takes looks pretty horrific for black. Oh, we're going for the pin uh, along the e file. This yeah. e file and uh, and everything. I mean, I, I really, yeah. I mean, I think you're probably lost already in this position. So, um, uh, and I don't know whether that you could do it. Um, you could do it better, or whether you even need to do it better. Actually. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe this is just this is just really clear. Knight to d five. Uh, you could go knight to d six. That's another one. Yeah. Um, but then I will probably go something like queen c five. And uh, well, I've got threats of knight takes c seven. Check. And yeah, also, and you I can't think. go knight e four because of queen takes. Oh no, queen takes e seven is not mate. You... Well, yeah, I could go queen. Could try. I, I could go um, queen takes d four, for example, and uh, yeah, and that e file still has pins. <laughs> Oh dear me! So um, I think that um, uh, yeah, uh, <coughs> this this is actually looking really serious for Black already. Um, I think this is um, uh, probably uh, um, yeah, pr probably the the Black player who's uh, who's very young uh, just um, wasn't quite um, up to date with the Evans Gambit stuff. So probably a very good choice there. So uh, looking good so far for um, for White there. Um, let's have a look. Uh, just see whether we can see Terry Chapman again, because I'm uh, obviously I've been looking at his white openings recently, so I'm quite uh, intrigued to see. No, I haven't got anything of his uh, yet. Just see whether it makes a difference if I search on the hideous Hulk. Ah, there we are. Okay. Oh, it's, it's Douglas Michael, not Michael. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Terry. Terry has, has done something I wasn't expecting there. My goodness me. So... We didn't look at this either. Knight f3, knight f6, d4, g6. And normally, Terry, without fail, plays um, c4 and then okay. plays a, a g3 king's Indian. And we have two of them, in actual fact, in uh, in the pro base, which was, um, um, which was a bit grim for me because it's one of the openings I really have studied least, I think, in all my career. So um, I was really struggling there. But this time, Terry, he goes the Mark Hebden route. He goes knight c3. Mm -hmm. The so, threatening e4. Um, so um, black played um, could play bishop g7, but then we go e4 and we're, we're in a perk. And uh, not all kings kings Indian players play that, uh, or Grunfeld players. A uh, Douglas Kirk, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So um, d5. Terry would have would have prepped very thoroughly for this, I would think. Ah, yeah, Terry, Terry always um, prepares very thoroughly. He, he always says how he uh, how he loves that whole uh, that whole thing of preparation, getting nervous, um, trying to work out what to do. So, um, and I think he's been, he's been trying out a few new openings recently. So, um, so this one, Bishop G seven, and he plays it in in this way actually, Knight B five. Um, this is the um, uh, quite a, um, uh, a new way of playing it. Uh, the point is we're attacking c7, so we force the black knight to a6. And then white plays e3, castles h3, c6, knight c3. Now, what has white actually gained through this maneuver? Um, the point is, um, well, black's you know, gained the tempo with c6, but black will probably play c5 later. 
Um, and when black plays c5, this knight is actually slightly misplaced. It would be much nicer on c6 or on d7. So um, you're just claiming that um, that you've um, um, that you've just uh, you know um, with a little maneuver you've just misplaced the um, uh, the black knight slightly, and the game goes on. Um, what you're also threatening, of course, is to go uh, bishop takes a6. Um, so black reacts with b5, which I haven't seen. Uh, I don't okay. think um, I've seen knight c7 in this position. Um, I think I've also seen b6, but b5 I've never seen. Let's have a look. We'll just have a little look to see whether uh, um, whether this uh, exists already. If it does, it's probably a game of Mark Hebden, who's uh, um, played this um, this opening, which uh, he calls the Barry, um, for many, many years. I suppose if you manage to swap that b pawn off, then you've always got a target of that... Um pawn on c6 exactly yes exactly i mean um uh this is quite a weakening move in actual fact uh, knight c has been played um a lot in this position so uh um knight c7 has been played by a lot of good players um b5 has only been played once um i think just one game um hobber against bergson um and yeah, White actually won that game. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm a little bit nervous about um, you know creating this weakness um, um, on c5, and obviously having the pawn on b5 makes it a bit harder to um, um, advance this pawn. Um, on the other mm. hand, b5 does clamp down against uh, c2 to c4, so um, uh, it's an interesting move. A little bit um, more committal than I would like to be in the opening uh, in the opening phase, but um, but well, interesting game. Uh, to look forward to there. Um, now let's have a look at the over 65s. Um, that's the Julian Farrand Cup, isn't it? Uh, yes, exactly. exactly. And Julian Farrand um, used to play for Cavendish Chess Club in the London League. Um, he's, he's actually, his son plays chess as well. So uh, his son is Tom Farrand. Um, and he was also on the panel for the um, ECF Book of the Year competition. Uh, exactly. So he, he actually did a lot of ECF ECF work, I think, and um, and uh, very nice guy, actually. So. Yeah, lovely guy, lovely guy. So it's uh, um, yeah, yeah, greatly missed, uh, and uh, yeah, lovely to uh, to remember him in this way. Um, now, this is uh, Crowthorn George against Mariner 235. That's George Green against Paul Kemp, who's one of the strongest players uh, in the tournament. Um, this is a Retty. Um, now, this last move, C4, um, now that's uh, quite a committal decision there, really. Um, um, when you play C4, um, well, obviously, you've got these two pawns on light squares, um, which means that if black manages to get an E5, um, then the D4 square is going to be very weak. And the other thing this this does, of course, is to um, weaken the D3 square. Um, and black straight away going into uh, in there with knight C5, looking at D3. Um, now, why did White play C4? I think White's idea with C4 was White wanted to play the move E4 to E5 yeah. and, and not allow Knight D5 after C4. Um, the only problem is, is that, you know, this move E4 to E5 is quite risky because it opens up the, the diagonal for this bishop. And uh, it's a really lurking bishop, this one. It cuts right across the white position. If you've got a pawn on e4, then great, you know, you're cutting it off. But if you play e5, then um, it's suddenly becoming very active. So I'd always, it's always a very risky decision to um, to play this e4 to e5. And uh, and certainly now that white's played c4 and knight c5 has come in, I would, um, um, I'd be getting slightly worried with uh, with white, to be honest, that I'm, uh, I'm losing some control of the position. Could you, like, leave it there, that pawn? Say, what happens if you go like knight e5 and yeah. then try and knight e5 is possible. I might just play a move like, um, uh, like knight d7, for example, to remove it, um, or I might just simply play a move like a5 and then go queen c7, rook d8, and then remove that knight on e5. Um, uh, yeah. the point is a bit tricky because you know, all these actually, um, are also. Uh, sometimes 
so hard to get the squares to get uh, activated there. Um, they're, they're, they're attacking this pawn on e4, so there's yeah. actually, uh, you're actually having to defend that as well. So the knight can't move too easily away from d2. So, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous about this, to be honest. Um, I think uh, um, I don't think white's really chosen uh, the setup very, uh, very well there. Um, for example, if you go something like queen c2 even, then uh, queen d3 could be very unpleasant, you know, just... Uh, um uh preparing to come with a d file and um and come in with a knight there so um um yeah king's indian attack that's uh that's right but um king's indian attack works best if if black hasn't played d takes e4 as soon as black plays d takes e4 um and with a bishop outside the um the pawn chain then you really don't want to move that pawn to e5 not unless you you've got a really quick follow up like um e5 and then a a knight e4 to d6 or something like that you've got to uh it's um it's a very committal decision to play e4 to e5 so you really need to uh to have a good follow up i think um okay let's have a look what else have we got here um douglas michael yeah, Terry's played a3. That's um, pretty decent. I think uh, yeah. Terry's, Terry's intending to play bishop d3, uh, castles, and then um, e3 to e4 at some stage. I think that's going to be the uh, uh, the plan. Uh, I quite like the look of this for white already. It's a very pleasant position, I think. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, white's, uh, white's, white's got a very comfortable edge here, I think. Um, that's right, uh, Mark, indeed. It's mixing systems. That's, that's exactly right. Should we look at Tim um, Harding? Oh, Tim Harding, yes, exactly. That's a good one. Tim Harding against Ed Goodwin. Hammer chewer, what a name. <laughs> wow. So regret my username on uh, chess.com. I really should have chosen mine better. <laughs> um, so this is uh, an English um, and uh, um, Black's played quite solidly here. White played Queen H4. So, um, you know, maybe looking for something like bishop g5, maybe bishop h6, bishop g5 is quite nice. And black's played queen a5, which is quite typical. Maybe black's going to aim to try and swap off queens. You never know. Um, what would I do here with, uh, with white? Um, I would probably play bishop g5 here, I think, and then follow up with rook c1 and uh, rook d1 and just uh, claim a nice, uh, a nice edge, uh, a nice little bit of extra space, I suppose. Um, the one thing you've got to watch out here, oh, bishop d2, uh, also uh, very sensible. Um, the one thing White's got to watch out for, and probably this move is maybe better than bishop g5 from that point of view, is that this pawn c4 um, mustn't get weak, you know, because black can attack it with bishop e6 and uh, queen b4 and rook c8. Got to watch out for the pawn on b7, but uh, um, but that's sometimes sacrificed. So bishop d2 uh, protects the knight on c3, which makes it easy for White to play b3. Um, so that's probably a very a very sensible uh, solid move there from uh, from white. Uh, let's have a look. Who else are we going to have a look at here? Um, maybe um, look at the under four under two thousand. Yeah. Yes. Um, we had. Um... I would like to see Edgar Wilson because I I know him. Um, he... Edgar Wilson. Edgar Wilson. Playing Aaron Rich. I think I do. Anyway, I think he's an, an actuary. Um, there are certainly no an actuary with that name that plays chess. So let's assume that. Oh, oh, now this is um, this has got a little bit um, interesting already. Um, a one a one b three opening. Then black followed up with f four. So it was a sort of a birds. So um, played by Aaron Rich and Edgar Wilson uh, played the knight into e four and knight c three has happened now. Okay. Um, what are we going to do here? Well, um, the nice thing about uh, Black's approach is that um, Black can play the bishop to f6 um, and try and neutralize this bishop. So um, uh, I think there's a couple of ideas. Knight c5 is uh, is quite sensible, I think, um, just to um, – uh, and what, uh, what Black might do then is uh, – oh, let me just uh, bring up an analysis diagram there. This is Aaron Rich, did you say? Yes. I am very prepared for today because I've got all my all my uh, chess playing biscuits today. Oh. I'm just gonna... So Aaron Rich would be Rich T, okay? <laughs> let me let me. Uh... Aha. See, I do hey. have a lot. Uh, yeah. So there's the Rich T. 
for Aaron oh. Rich. Okay, you got, so you got to, you're going to have one every time we. Um, we I don't uh, have one for every game, but I do have quite a lot. <laughs> Fantastic. So knight d c five um, uh, is not a bad idea because the idea then is to, um, for example, if we're f three, we could uh, take good knight e four and then just um, well either play bishop b four or play c three. Um, and the idea is just to try and block this diagonal um, because white's going to play rook f3, uh, rook h3 at some stage, and we're going to play g6 to uh, stop the queen getting to h5. But then we really want to be able to cover this diagonal. Um, we can also play bishop f6 as well. But um, this would be a, a very sensible way of playing, I think, knight dc5. Um, For the crowd, here's Nigel Shortbread because Richard was asking. <laughs> <laughs> shortbread we have um and we are yes we will actually we've got the we're looking at the under 2000s at the moment um and we will also look at um uh, we can we can look at some games from the under 1400 as well i think those are the only two that are happening right at the moment simon williams the ginger gm snap biscuit if you must um yep <laughs> <laughs> the ginger gm biscuit is there is there we have that that's all there the one i'm missing the one i'm missing which i just thought of uh this morning which i'm really pleased with but i actually couldn't find is the uh, anish giri baldy biscuit <laughs> but I, I, I i they weren't in in my local shops so i didn't get that one curses that's uh uh wonderful wonderful stuff um oh let's have a quick look at bishop raider against lego children because that was quite exciting mm. Mm. What what look at those there? nights. So, um, well, I don't think that this was the best line. White played bishop takes f7. Um, but it's quite dangerous all the same. Um, queen takes f7, takes takes, knight b5. You can see the true Evans Gambit player here, really, because uh, refusing to win material, you know, just wanting to sacrifice it, I think. Um, so, um, black played c6. Ooh, and uh, knight c7 looked pretty strong, and knight d6 also looks very tempting. Smooth Baron, I'm going to explain how to get to the games on Chestock. Ooh, Anish Seed Balls. That's yes, very, very good, good very good. Very good one, Mark, very good. So um, I would have been very tempted with Knight D6 check here, um, or Knight C7. Uh, knight B takes D4 is, is uh, was um, uh, a little bit more restrained, but H6, ooh, H6, Knight E5 check. King e8, knight f5. Oh, and I'm afraid that black has just blundered here um, because we here we can just play knight takes e7. Oh, and there's a fork. Um, on and then there's a fork on g6 afterwards. So um, um, I'm not sure that white played the best line there, but um, but it's going to be good enough. Um, let's have a look. Clive Frostrick against uh, Tim Kett. Ah, well, um, actually, uh, this has pretty much happened as I. Um, expected. White's played bishop f4 um, and uh, queen f3, queen f3, bishop f4, playing rook d1. <laughs> Very uh, good. Sure <laughs> <laughs> oh, these are fantastic. Jesus. Oh, Black Forest Gatto, Natasha. I don't have that. Yes. I have um, I have some Anna, Anna Ginger Thins, which actually does three at once. So Anna Chess, Ginger GM, and also the Finn Brothers, Anna Ginger <laughs> Finns. There we go. Thought that was a good one. And then, um, of course, if you uh, if you remember the publisher, um, they, we have um, Byron Jacobs. Oh, Jacobs biscuits. Exactly. My goodness. It's going to take me a while to get through all these biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah we should uh, you should actually have one every time um every time that we mention a player or something you should just <laughs> you should take a biscuit i would have to have a nap if i ate all those biscuits so uh, every time I, I you know i mention one of uh, simon williams's uh, chess books for example <laughs> have a biscuit yeah, i think you'd be quite full at the end um so rook 81 so what is white going to play here um why has got a couple of plans um knight a4 um followed by c4 it's one idea. Um, another very typical idea is to go knight e2. And then when the bishop gets recaptured, we come around to f4 and attack this knight on e, this bishop on e6. It's not um, um, horrific for um, for black, but that pressure is slightly annoying. Um, so, um, and uh, yeah, for black, um, well, black often throws in a rook b8 to try and weaken the queen side a bit. 
maybe tries and plays c5 at some stage but it's not easy not easy for uh for black to make progress here i always find these positions you'd be cream cracked <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's very good <laughs> so um uh yeah so it's quite difficult quite difficult i always find for black to uh to do anything uh, sensible you know the only people who seem to be able to win this with black are people like uh, magnus carlson who can win anything really but uh, i never feel it's anything to do with the opening um let's have a look how david walk against rob wilmot is getting on Ooh, well rob has gone for a full uh a full central expansion there um uh, which um always seems very very risky to me but um uh i quite like white's knights there what do you think yeah yeah i mean it, it, it i'm always very very nervous about playing like this as black probably because uh you know as a junior I tended to to, uh, to like the centre maybe a bit too much. Huntley and Palmer Ken Neats. Well done, Mark. That's very good. It's um, hey Shivant, how are you? Um, yeah, I, I, I was very keen on advancing my centre, and I got um, I lost a number of games against uh, Retties where um, cunning older players just um, you know got got into my squares and destroyed my centre. Um, but it's not necessarily bad. I mean. Um, mm. Uh, <coughs> pardon me. I think the one, the one thing in Black's favour here is that uh, White's played the pawn to b3, so there's no queen b3 taking place here. Let's bring up an analysis diagram and try and sack something and see what we can uh, see what we can do with this. <coughs> pardon me. I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Um, oh, good lord! I think uh, Alexa is saying something to me. <laughs> yes, uh, Alexa was saying something to me. Um, I was, I was wondering who is that lady um so what can we do here um i mean it feels like you might want to sacrifice something on d5 or e4 but i don't think you're going to manage really are you um so maybe white should simply play a move like um uh, bishop b2 maybe yeah and if we go knight c6 then i can go knight b5 knight e2 Got to watch out a little bit. I mean, we, we could have a knight g4 at some stage, but queen d2 is normally enough to defend it. Ooh, although I, I'm just, um, I was looking at knight here, knight g4. It suddenly occurred to me that queen d2, you might, uh, you could play a move like bishop b4, which okay. might be a bit, uh, irritating. So you've got to be a little bit careful here. Um, c takes d5. I'm trying to think of a good way to do this. Um, uh, G four. <laughs> oh dear! You could take that, surely. Oh, what? What are you going to take it with, though, Natasha? Yeah. I was thinking of taking it with the knight. Yeah, then I'll take on D five, uh, and I'm trying to take on E four afterwards. That might be decent. Uh, okay. So maybe maybe g4 would you go uh, f takes g4 and then I'll, then I'll take on e4 like this might be interesting might be interesting mm. it's a little bit odd knight c6 i could go g5 um knight g4 knight takes d5 i mean you could just be destroying your position completely that's the <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the problem of course so um uh um, if I was going to do this, I mean, it's stuff like this, for example. Uh, well, it's a total mess, isn't it, really? Because um, this knight is trapped, but um, I've got, I've got all sorts of ideas as well. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure. G force maybe a little bit um, OTT. Um, mm. That is definitely something you do with somebody else's pieces. Um, but if black plays knight c6. Ah, Black's no. Actually, I think probably Black's position is quite uh, is quite okay here. Actually, um, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the center the center looks very mm -hmm. solid. I don't see an easy way to uh, to get at it. And if Black's center is solid, then actually you're just um, restricting this bishop. I mean, maybe G four is is just uh, is not such a bad idea because actually, of course, if if you go um, um, Knight C six, I could actually just take on F five here. You know, which would be quite. Uh, um, probably quite reasonable yeah so um it might be worth investigating g4 it seems like the one moment uh you know you've got where um uh, before uh black species get really really active um so that might be interesting uh has a move uh, happened yet a oh, white when d takes c4 
that's um, <laughs> it's really small too. It's really small too. But again, uh, I think it's the the the. I think Black just plays uh, D takes E four here and uh, shouldn't really have too many problems. I think because we play um, we play Knight C six after and uh, swap off the Knight, get the Bishop to C six or to E six, and um, and just this one's a little bit passive, you know, and uh, and the E three pawn's a little bit weak. So um, oh, B four. Uh, B4. All right, that's a very interesting move. Looking to uh, to come into E6. Um, I suppose the question is here. Um, oh, if takes, you just go Queen B3. Exactly. So uh, takes takes B4. So if Bishop takes B4, we've got Queen B3. Indeed, that's absolutely right. So the big question here is: Can I go Knight C6? Um, White will go queen b3 check, king h8. Uh, I suppose we've got a few things here. I mean, knight e6 takes, takes, e is kind of a pawn, really. Um, yeah, I think that's just a pawn. I don't think that's a particularly good one. But I, I suppose what White's aiming for, maybe, maybe White will go knight takes c6 here. Um, and if we go bishop takes c6, then we might go uh, b5, something like that. And... Uh, you know, if the bishop comes back, uh, maybe rook d1. Yeah, rook d1. Yeah. A, little, yeah. a little bit passive, a little bit passive there. Um, I actually think what might be interesting is to go uh, b takes c6. Um, it looks a little bit strange, but um, you are actually threatening rook b8 and uh, an a5 then. And, um, you know, the rook b8, the rook b8 on, um, on this line is, uh, is a little bit annoying. Um, so that might be a good way of getting some uh, some counterplay. You've also, you know, you also might be able to play a quick uh, a quick c five there, or or go queen c eight and bishop e six. Mm. And, uh, um, so interesting. I, I don't think it's uh, it's anything uh, particular for white, but um, ah, you know, quite a quite a, an interesting unbalanced game. Um, no, Stockfish, uh, Shivanta, Stockfish NNUE is uh, s uh, trained on its own game. So it's uh, lots of uh, self-played Stockfish games. So uh, no human games at all. I think the uh, there's, I think there's only one engine at the moment that's trained on human games, partly. And that's the uh, the engine Stoffface, which is um, a weird and crazy one, funnily enough. So uh, that's the craziest of all the, uh, of all the chess engines. So... Uh, it's um, uh, it's done by one guy called uh, Giancarlo Pascuto, who wrote um, uh, um, who wrote an engine, a former world champion engine back in two thousand seven. I think it was Deep Sheng, and um, he came back and uh, did a neural net, but trained on all sorts of games, um, and some of them are uh, top grandmaster games. Um, and the style is is great. It's always sacking stuff. But it's just um, just like a human, slightly fragile tactically, makes blunders from time to time. So, uh, Sheng, that's right. Yeah, that's right, uh, Mark. Uh, so, um, really a great engine. Really um, super, super, super style to uh, to play with. Um, uh, let's have a look. Hammerchewer. I've got to see this. Uh, oh, yes. Is, uh, ah, indeed. So, the Queens did get exchanged on h5, as we said. Takes, takes. And... Um, well, white is just a little bit better here. A um, bit more space, uh, better development. Um, and actually, could this be... Ooh, uh, this might get a little bit... Uh, could get a little bit tricky for black. Um, something like bishop e3 could be interesting. Um, attacking a7 pawn. Um, something like rook c1 is definitely very sensible, followed by b3, and then put the knight onto b5 or d5, for example. Um, that would be the sort of um, the obvious um, uh, the obvious uh, way of playing. Yes, no, human, uh, good to see human chess. It's, uh, I think, um, obviously, you know, computers are way in advance of anything that we can do. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's also human chess is still fantastically interesting and fantastically good to uh, to follow as well. So at whatever level, you know, I mean, um, uh, we're having a fantastic time, you know, commentating on these games mm. that aren't being played by the world's top players, but still have lots of drama, interest and, uh, and interesting points and things that puzzle you and you can't work out straight away. So, um, you know, really, uh, really good stuff. It's, uh, it's just a great game to follow, I guess. That's, um, 
Let's have a look at board one. Um, Pete Leonard against uh, um, uh, David Bray on board one. Ah, this has gone uh, pretty even, this one. Um, White's got a slight advantage, I suppose you'd say, slightly better bishop, but um, that's not a, not really um, very serious. Uh, you're right, actually. Yeah, this looks like one of those uh, queen a5 to h5 variations. So, um, no, you don't have to be friends with the players. If you just do um, uh, observe... Um, I'll type one in. So, slash observe... What's his name? Douglas Michael. <laughs> What was it? Is it? This is. Um, it's Douglas Michael, Terry. right? Yeah. So if I type it in the chat like that, if you if you do that, yeah, Deus Ex. I'm, I'm not sure. Deus Ex. It, it it turned into something else, didn't it? Or um, um, I'm not sure whether whether that was the basis for uh, for what became Fat Fritz. Um, uh, in the end, the neural net that was uh, distributed by um, uh, by uh, uh, Chessbase. So uh, it was certainly certainly the guy um, Albert Silver who uh, who's, I think was involved in DSX. He was involved in uh, in Fat Fritz as well. Um, but it is um, yeah yeah I, I do think it's a lovely idea to uh, to train on human games and see how uh, how good you can get. Uh, I just um, I just love this idea that um, that uh, Stoflace trained on human games and therefore is a, a bit tactically fragile compared to uh, to the other engines. But from time to time gets these incredible bursts of creativity. Just a uh, ah, really nice, uh, really nice concept. Douglas Michael, let's have a look. How is Terry Chapman doing? Oh, Terry has played B4. <laughs> that is very interesting. That is probably a very good move, actually, um, because um, we're clamping down on C5. No black uh, counterplay with B4. The bishop on B7 is passive, and uh, yes. White will at some stage play uh, play E4. Now that's a very nice positional move, I think. Uh, uh, Terry is a very good positional player. Um, he's um, he's uh, um, yeah he's always uh, been uh, quite uh, self-deprecating about his tactics. Uh, he feels that he's um, sometimes a bit tactically fragile, but um, in positional play, he's very very good. And um, uh, I think we were lucky enough um, in uh, in our games that um, somehow we managed to get to these positions where we you know we just got uh, these nice structures and we had to put our piece on good squares. And uh, Terry was very strong in those, you know, just um, we were just uh, completely on the same wavelength, just, uh, you know, maneuvering our pieces nicely. So a very good player from that point of view. So, yeah, it must be a uh, bit annoying black for black. The um, can't really activate the queen because the knight on c7 will be hanging and the pawn on c6 is going to be backwards all the time. Yeah, I mean, um, the risk a little bit is um, is that you're just going to end up in a in a worse ending, uh, and that you're not going to get any counterplay because, of course, you know, black can't play c5, so e5 would normally be the um, um, you know the thing that you'd want to do. But um, you know, white's uh, pieces are, are brilliantly placed to hold back e5, and of course, you know, the fact that this knight went to a6 rather than c6 or d7 is also uh, very useful from that point of view. Mm. So. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, White, White's got two ideas. Well, two ideas. White's got many ideas, actually. Um, White could play, um, oh, Nat Paul versus Jeff Conroy in the under 2000. Okay, let's have a look at that one. Um, uh, Jeff Conroy, just having a look there. Um, Blunderful. Blunderful. I've got it. I've got it. Oh, brilliant. Thanks, Natasha. Um, yeah, so it'll be the third one. There, yeah, blunderful one, two, three. Blunderful one, two, three. Uh... Ooh, okay. Um, black, a pawn up indeed. Ooh, we have another um, rook ending. Another rook ending here. We saw a great one, didn't we, yesterday? Uh, uh, Mark Hebden. Um, yes. Uh, grinding down his uh, extremely um, um, obdurate opponent um, in a very long rook and two versus rook and one ending. That was really, um, uh, yeah, really quite amazing um, uh, to see that. And uh, we did think that um, although Black was defending very well for a long time, that um, we did think that Mark would uh, would probably get it in the end. And Keith Arkell, the master of rook and two versus rook and one, he was uh, he came on to the uh, um, he came into the chat and predicted as well that Mark would win. And um, indeed, it's it's a tricky one. It was a really tricky one. Very instructive, actually. So um, 
Um, it's uh, Ja Levon, uh, Levon Aronian. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, he is a, a, an amazing player and, uh, yeah, just a really, really heavy year for him, of course, um, with uh, a death of his wife and also of obviously Armenia is... Uh, um, very much in um, uh, embroiled in a, a very difficult political situation as well, and uh, but he's um, he's coming back to his best, I think, uh, or at least he's enjoying his chess an awful lot and, and coming up with some incredible ideas. I don't think he's got his uh, consistency back yet, but um, but um, yeah, I mean he's uh, uh, he's doing great. I mean he also has some health problems for a while as well, which uh, uh, interfered with his sleep. Um, so uh, he's had a rough time, but. Um, you know, well, I mean, uh, obviously, you you really hope um, uh, that uh, that he gets to his full strength and that he can challenge for the world championship again sometime. Because uh, otherwise, he'll be one of those amazing players like Paul Carreras or Victor Kortner. You know, where you say, ah, oh, you know, one of the strongest players ever not to win the world mm -hmm. championship. You know, it's uh, um, frankly, I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, look, looking at it, I, I would have settled for that. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, you know, the, the talent of these guys is amazing. You know, but um, but good to see him playing some fantastic chess as well. You know, it's uh, really amazing. Um, yeah. Um, so white is threatening rook d7, and black is obviously a bit nervous about that, trying to exchange off a pair of rooks. Yeah, uh, this might might just be repeated a lot of times. I think. Yeah, I mean, I would play rook c7 to be honest. I mean, that would be the uh, the best way, I think. And uh, and then you play the rook round to b7, and you're defending f7 and attacking um, b3. You know, so. Uh, um, it's not going to be an easy one to win. I mean, uh, let's be clear about that because uh, um, White's rooks are pretty good, and this rook on f3 is a good piece, you know. Um, but if you play um, the rook to c7, um, I mean, what what would you actually uh, aim to do? Let's just uh, go to a quick analysis board. Um, I think you know the one thing that you've got to think of with uh, with Black, and this is what these um, uh, great technicians, Bogolubov, one of my <laughs> favourite players. And um, nobody thinks anything of him, but uh, um, there is a great book uh, came out recently by uh, published by Elkin Ruby, so Ivan Rubin, Rubin um, former Kent Junior. Um, and uh, oh, I, <laughs> sorry, I'm plugging this. I've got to mention I, I wrote a forward for it, so um, uh, I am biased, of course. But I did a lot of work uh, on my blog actually analyzing games of um, of uh, Bogolubov, and I really thought he was an underrated player. You know. Um, uh, and um, uh, and I mean, he had a, an amazing life as well. I mean, he was interned at the end of the um, uh, at the beginning of the First World War. He was playing in Germany. He was a Russian, and uh, he was interned for four years. And that's really where he became strong, playing against all the other Russian chess masters who were interned in the same place. You know, they played loads and loads of tournaments there. And, um, and it's amazing you can get to grandmaster level like that. It is amazing. It's really true, and um, uh, and then of course you know um, he was caught up in the whole tragedy of um, of um, of Nazi Germany. Um, he um, after after the war he married a, a German lady and uh, uh, stayed in Germany, and then was caught up in uh, in the whole thing of uh, of Nazi Germany. He um, um, so yeah, I mean it's very um, uh, um, he had a very tragic uh, life, just like Alekin. I mean Alekin. Um, I think lost everything in the uh, First World War. Was reported dead at um, at, uh, at at many times, and then became a controversial figure uh, during uh, the Second World War. Um, so, um, but I think you know a lot of people. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, just amazing times. We, we just can't imagine uh, what they are. And uh, and again, you're you're. I'm always amazed with these uh, 1920s, 1930s guys that. Um, uh, how did they get so strong with uh, compared to us, you know, with uh, so little, you know, training, knowledge, uh, no computers or anything? Um, you look at Anakin's annotations and you have to pinch yourself and uh, remember that he didn't have an engine. You know, I mean, it's really, uh, really incredible. Well, Rooks DB, we were looking at um, Rook C7 for Black as Indeed. a way to, to keep playing on uh, because it defends that, that second rank. Um, and uh, and and then you can move the rook around to b7 as well to attack that pawn on b3. Could, yeah, I'm wondering, Mark. I've never, do you know, I've never actually read this uh, Stefan Zweig's uh, chess novelette. That's uh, that should be something I do in the lockdown, isn't it? It's definitely got to be. Uh, uh, have, did, did you enjoy it, uh, Mark? That's, um, uh, let's have a look. Yeah, so we were expecting rook c7, but they have drawn by a repetition. Um, oh, let's have a look um, at uh, this game because uh, I was a bit critical of, um, of White's play here. But um, 
E5, ooh, black went knight F E4 here. I was kind of expecting uh, um, knight D7, to be honest, um, and then uh, get a whole... Uh, a whole train of knights, you know, just moving round uh, into c5 to d3. I'm not sure about this exchange so much because uh, um, knight d4, knight c5, queen e2. White's playing a little bit with fire here. Just uh, if we go into uh, d3 now, yeah. Yeah, you could do, but uh, but probably um, this is not so bad because if I went knight d3, we just go rook d1, and maybe you haven't got a um, a good follow up there, possibly. Um, so black played queen b6. Rook d1, a5, queen e3, rook d8, bishop a3, rook d7. Uh, still looking a little bit awkward for um, for white here. Black's going to double off on the d file, and this knight on d4 is not great. Yeah, no, I, I, white's still in uh, in trouble here. Um, uh, I mean, essentially, you know, all of black's um, pieces are, um, uh, you know, sort of, and this rook is going to come here and aim here as well. They're all sort of converging onto that point, you know, beautifully um, concentrated power. And um, yeah, and I'm not, you know, white doesn't really have uh, anything to com compensate. Oh, good lord! Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan Zweig's novelette. Wow, I'm I'm, I'm going to read it then, uh, uh, Mark. Thanks for the tip. It's uh, thanks for reminding me because uh, I've always meant to read it and never have. Reminded of Alpha Zero, my goodness. Oh, he was taken against himself, wasn't he? He was uh, taken against yeah. himself in prison, that's right. Indeed, indeed. It's, uh, um, oh, I'll, I'll definitely read that. I've read a synopsis of the, of the plot, but never uh, never read it. Uh, um, how is um, uh, Lego Children? Ooh, this is a good advertisement for the Evans Gambit, isn't it? Uh, peace up, and uh, this e-pawn is marching through to uh, to glory, I think. Oh yes, Capablanca's indeed, yeah. indeed. And there was, uh, the, the, I mean, there was that. Um, it was Capablanca's Knights, but of course, the uh, quite cheekily, the um, the amazing game in that was a game of uh, of Alakin. So that's on our on our um, on our um, um, on my blog um, video page, and uh, um, it was um, uh, a theme where uh, knights follow each other around the board, and Alakin's Knights do an amazing tour um uh, all through the board and uh, the only sad thing about it is that um that you know really the 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 final move should have been a knight you know moving uh keeping in touch but somehow that didn't quite go but there's a whole sequence of uh 14 or 15 moves where alakin's knights follow each other from left to right uh king side queen side and uh, and win there it's um no it doesn't take long to read it's uh, indeed it, it, it is quite a short uh, a short book ah that's good uh, a good idea um let's have a look um ah so this actually happened a little bit as we thought um i suggested uh, b take c6 here uh, rob took on c6 with a bishop okay and now um bishop h3 hmm. i'm wondering about that move a little bit um simply because um uh i think that um black's bishop is not well placed on c6 so i was kind of expecting it to go back to uh um to d7 anyway um, I was sort of expecting, um, uh, yeah, maybe bishop d7, and if rook d1, I'll go queen c8 and then bishop e6. Um, so, you know, I go bishop b2, bishop b6, and then I've got myself organized somehow. So um, I'm not sure that playing bishop h3 was the move. I, I thought maybe maybe bishop b2, you know, and, uh, and get the rook to c1 uh, early. And um, uh, I thought that was maybe a good a good idea, but um, well, we'll see how that uh, how that goes. Have you got? Um, I see you've put a few things in the uh, yes. Chat. So the the first one there was a game from the under fourteen hundreds. Oh, lovely! Peacock, oh. which is um, Katie Ball that we followed uh, one of her games in the women's tournament earlier this week. Oh, Parking Peacock! I'm afraid she hasn't come up there, so we must have. Uh, she maybe has finished already. Finished and the next one was the top board of the under two thousands. City Fat Cat. So, uh, Miss Sun, Missia, Marius against um, City Fat Cat. Ooh. Um, we've got a little trap here. What's uh, Black going to play if it's his move? If it's Black's move, well, you could take on d5. Indeed, and the uh, there's a big pin there. So a rook on so. a3 and a pin on the e file. 
Yeah, so um, yeah, black, white pieces are a little loose here. Um, it makes me a, a little bit nervous. Um, I think so what can doing, white do, in fact? You'll be doing well to avoid the loss of a pawn, I feel. Um, he removes the rook off, please. I mean, you, you could you could play um, rook here. I mean, this is possible. Uh, let, sorry, let me just get this. Oh, this arrow. <laughs> this arrow seems in perpetuity. Uh, there rook d1 is not stupid. I mean, we're threatening bishop takes f7, maybe. Um, but then we're going to go um, rook to d8. And uh, it's a nasty pin. I think, you, I think you're going to lose a pawn. You're going to lose that d pawn. Um, uh yeah imagination solving studies definitely agree uh, analyzing with fritz i'm not i don't know um it's a, it's an art analyzing with an engine to be honest because uh um if you analyze with an engine running in the background your brain switches off very very quickly i do find um i think you know my tip always for analyzing with engines is to analyze for 15 minutes by yourself then write down the variations um, and then afterwards check it with the engine. I think that always works better if you uh, um, if you analyze um, uh, if you analyze uh, with the engine running. Yeah, it's um, I, 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 well certainly for, it, for for me. I always end up uh, just saying, oh well, let the guy <laughs> let the strong guy do the work, and I'll um, I'll just watch, um, which is not really the uh, not really the point. Um, it's um, uh, yeah. I mean, Fritz in two thousand four. Um, on, on commodity hardware, probably it wasn't stronger than the best GMs uh, still, I think. Um, but we were just maybe reaching the point where it was, it was about to. Um, it's. Uh, I remember the good old times. I once, right towards at the end of my professional career, I am. Um, uh, that was 1999, I, I got Fritz. And um, that was, uh, wasn't such a strong engine, but tactically it was incredibly good um and uh yeah there was a few uh tried it out on a few of my uh, variations and it found some stuff which was you know what my first experience anyway of a, of a computer being useful for uh um for anything more than the, than a database program um okay let's have a look um how about pete, this is over 65s pete morris against brian gosling that's board four. Oh, board four um over ireland against england Ireland against Spudlover. <laughs> oh, Spudlover, Spudlover. Sorry, I thought it was Spudlover. Uh, yes, <laughs> I thought it was uh, a, a Eastern, but, uh, Eastern European player. <laughs> yes, it is, but um, uh, it is in fact um, Spudlover. So, what have we got here? Um, an English opening. Um, White has got the two bishops. Black's got the d4 square, and there's a few weaknesses on the king side as well quite a um uh quite an unclear position actually um i guess one thing that black might do here is play c6 and d5 try and chase away that knight on e4 um one thing that white might try and do is to um if he can possibly do it get g4 f5 in something like that and uh um but uh, it's going to be it's all it's, it's just a very sharp position and uh um, just depend tactically who is going to survive or not. I think if I was white, then F takes E5 looks maybe quite strong. Let me have a look. That might be working tactically. That's the first thing that uh, a very good tip from um, that I learned from um, from Tal. Uh, what you're looking at Tal's games was uh, always look at captures first. Uh, I did notice as a grandmaster that um, um, I, I got maybe a bit too subtle. I, you know, I was always looking for complicated ways of doing things, and then I I looked at how Tal attacks and. Uh, I found that he either takes things or attacks things, and uh, <laughs> the subtle stuff uh, that always comes later. So um, uh, uh, from then, from that point of view, I always uh, f takes e five. Yeah, knight g five is um, is a possibility, but it might. Um, we do have to calculate knight takes g three in that case, um, because queen g three, there's knight e two. Um, so um, I mean, you can go uh, after knight g three, you can go bishop d five, check king h eight, but I'm not sure. I mean, I'm threatening this rook on f1, so I think this is always going to be good for um, for black. <laughs> potato on potato world. Mm -hmm. Spitting image quotes. Ooh. Are you watching the new series it. of uh, Are you watching the new era series of uh, spitting image, uh, Mark? Um, I've, uh, I've I've sort of heard very mixed comments about it. It's um, it um, uh, I, I watched it in the old days, but I haven't watched the the new one. There. I watched the first episode. 
um and and i got the kids to watch as well um yeah i, I it, it wasn't like the old days yeah um yeah i remember watching it every week in the old days and yeah no, it was a bit mean actually i, I know it always is i know that's what it's meant to be but um yeah yeah that was really uh yeah yeah mm -hmm. somehow i didn't um uh, I, I had quite good memories of it, of uh, being, you know, sort of a, you, you sort of sniggered and you were being a little bit mean, but it feels very innocent nowadays compared to uh, to what you see everywhere on uh, on social media. Different times, I guess. Um, F takes E5 is interesting here. Um, so um, I think Black would rather play Bishop takes E5 if he can. Um, and now we've got two ideas. We've got uh, G4 and we've got Bishop G5. Um, if we go g4 so my original idea was um if you go knight h4 um i've got rook f8 you know that was why it attracted to me because uh if queen f8 we've got queen h4 and uh that's a little bit risky but um i think we're fine i, I don't think uh uh knight e2 king h1 that there's anything that black can do oh wait a minute um uh yeah sorry a little double take on that one because we actually got knight takes c1 here Okay, uh, queen, queen f4. Queen f4. <laughs> ooh, ooh, oh, that's actually quite nasty. Um, is that actually working? Queen h4, knight e2, king h1, knight c1. Uh, can't we throw in a? Can we throw in a knight g5 or something? Ooh, knight g5 might be awkward. My goodness. Oh, this is complicated. Um, then you could go. Could you? Oh. Um, try becoming a GM. Um, any tips? Oh, I don't know really. Um, I think um, uh, if you're um, if you're going to be an amateur and you think you know, I'd love to keep on improving and keep on um, uh, and become a GM. I think the secret is to sort of take the long term view on it, um, which is you know you, you're not going to have time to do hours and hours every every evening, but. Um, over a long period of time, if you do a little bit every evening, regular work, then you'll be amazed at how it builds up. So um, uh, I think, you know, I think what I did quite well when, when I came back playing uh, as an amateur was uh, I did, um, I always said I set myself, I did 15 minutes of uh, chess work every evening. Um, now, I will do have to admit, I did a little bit more than that at times, but um, I'm a bit obsessive. But um, I always try to do a little bit every evening. And um, you do a little work on on uh, on openings, a little bit of work on end games. Um, you select um, a group of openings that you uh, like, that you're going to build up over a period of time. And by the time you've got uh, you know half a year further or whatever, um, you suddenly find that you've got you know reasonable openings. You're into chess all the time because you're exercising your brain. And um, uh, um, and and you're building up knowledge, you know. And um, I think certainly also analysing your own games when you play a game at the weekend, yeah. um, then uh, do you know spend an hour afterwards just um, thinking through, writing down what you thought during the game. Very important. Uh, check the tactics with an end game, but concentrate especially on writing down what you thought. And then uh, again, over six months' time, you'll look back and you'll be amazed at how much knowledge uh, of yourself. Mm -hmm. How you play during the game, how you feel during a game, and also what you thought um, you've built up, and then all of a sudden, um, I always think that's like it's like a, a dam bursting at some stage. Um, suddenly, all that good uh, training and knowledge that you've built up about yourself um, that suddenly bursts, and you have a, a great uh, um, a great period of, uh, of activity, um, and uh, doing fun stuff like uh, studies. Um, there's a great book which I'm going to recommend actually by. Um, Cyrus Lakdawalla uh, that came out for Every Man Chess. Uh, now he's probably you, you might know him mainly for opening books, um, and he he does an awful lot of them. Um, but uh, and uh, you know some people have mixed feelings about him, but he does from uh, from time to time bring out a really nice book. And um, he did one on Ulf Anderson's openings, which I thought was was very nice concept, just to go through Ulf Anderson, the very solid Swedish GM, and show how he played as white. And he brought out another book um, on studies, uh, studies and and um, uh, problems, and it's a wonderful read. He uh, he's got a, quite an engaging way of writing, and uh, he brings you through all these different studies, mate in twos, mate in threes, bizarre positions. It's really stimulating and inspiring, and um, I really recommend that as uh, as a book to um, uh, to get your fantasy going, you know, and uh, just test you out in a different way. 
Um, you know, if you spend uh, 15 minutes in an evening playing one minute bullet, um, then you'll just feel you've wasted your time. If you spend 15 minutes solving one of those tough, bizarre problems and you've got there in the end, you feel great. You know, it's very, very positive feeling. So uh, I'd definitely recommend that. But um, a bit of regular chess every, um, every day, um, 15 minutes uh, minimum. Um, and um, uh, uh, um, certainly uh, thinking about your own games, writing down what you thought during a game. That's, uh, you know, that's uh, whenever you play a practical game. Um, and then just build that up over over a longer period of time. I think that's a, a really good way to improve and quite a fun and fun and, uh, and you know, um, and um, uh, yeah, a, a nice way to do it, really, you know, rather than just studying openings, looking at computer variations. It's, um, you know, I think that's a very um, I've done. And I know because I've done that at some stage. I um, I was just focusing on opening preparation. Um, obviously, you know, I, 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 I was already 2600 um, as an amateur. So, um, you know, it is quite important to get openings right. But I, at some stage, I was doing so much, I was getting you know, quite depressed about uh, about playing chess and uh, doing, uh, you know, focusing again on middle games and uh, and that sort of stuff. That really gave me a lot more joy in, uh, in what I was doing. Because at the end of the day, it's got to be fun. If you're going to do yeah. hard, hard work as an amateur, it's got to be fun. You know, it, you can't, uh, you're not a professional. You mustn't pretend that you are. You've got to, uh, you've got to be clever and work out how to um how to get the most out of yourself as an amateur um uh i'll just uh, just one more thing i want to say about that is that um just in 2012 2012 or 2011 maybe um i've just come back as an amateur and i played two tournaments and i played great absolutely wonderful um i went with friends to barcelona very strong open and i won it with eight and a half out of ten won a great last round game then i went to the oslo open and I think I wanted a point and a half clear. It was a very strong open. And uh, I was really relaxed and playing well. And then um, a, uh, uh, um, I got invited to uh, Vikanze, um, this fantastic tournament. And I got invited to the C group. Um, so I was going to be one of the strongest players there. Um, and uh, um, But I had never played in Vikanze. So I thought, oh, great, we'll do that. But it turned out to be, um, I hadn't quite thought it through really because if i can say i don't know whether you've ever been but um it's a small tournament uh, in the north of holland uh done, played in the winter so it's very cold it's uh, very windy it's very rainy um and there's nothing you to do you have to chess. like chess for that one <laughs> exactly and it was uh 16 17 days long and um i uh I'd, I'd had a lunatic time at work just before i was taking exams as well and i rushed from my last exam to Vikanze, and I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, this is all my holiday for the year, and I'm going to be playing chess for 17 days. Uh, and um, uh, it was, um, I, it's a wonderful experience to be part of it. I mean, it's incredible, but it wasn't what I was looking for. This is a nice one. That's where we uh, launched the Game Changer book. Um, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it was a wonderful experience to be around there. But um, as a as an amateur, um, I would really have wanted maybe um, a more sunny tournament like uh, like Barcelona, where in the morning you could go around, look at the architecture, and uh, relax, do a little bit of preparation. Whereas uh, here, this was uh, this was too much for me as a professional. It would have been a dream. As an amateur, for me, it was uh, it was uh, it was not quite the right tournament. So you've got to make sure that you pick tournaments, and that was actually one of the tips that. Uh, that we got from Chess for Life, pick tournaments that you enjoy, you know, that uh, that you really love. Um, sorry, I'm talking too much there. Uh, let's have a look at Douglas Michael against Hideous Hog. Oh, this is a nice idea from uh, from Terry here. Actually, he's um, uh, he's really doing a total clamp on the uh, um, on the black structure. Um, it's uh, uh, oh, thanks, Mark. Thanks. It's uh, um, but uh, don't uh, hesitate to um, to sort of put, put a screen in the chat if uh, you say, "Come on, Matthew," and uh, and Natasha, concentrate on the chess, please, because uh, yeah, it's uh, obviously we are there to uh, to look at the great game. So this is a very nice idea from Terry. Um, it's actually uh, taken from the Dutch. Um, there is an idea. Shall I, can I show you that quickly? Um, I'll just show you because it's one of the um, uh, things that the Russian trainer Mark Koretsky showed to me. Um, and uh, it's against the Stonewall Dutch. So uh, d4, f5, g3, knight, f6. 
bishop g2, um, e6. So this was when his uh, pupil, uh, Arthur Yusupov, who uh, was a very strong grandmaster, he came to uh, to you to uh, Dvoretsky one day and he said, I want to play the um, the uh, the Stonewall Dutch. And Dvoretsky said, are you crazy? This is a terrible <laughs> thing. Um, and um, uh, um, Yusupov said, no, said oh, I want to play it. And so they started playing some practice games. And uh, indeed, Dvoretsky was um, beating him very easily at the start. But later on, you know, Yusupov got into it and actually this became one of his best ever openings. But the trick that, um, that uh, Dvoretsky caught him in the very first game was he played Bishop F4. And now the very best move is to take on f4, to force white to take back with a g pawn. And then afterwards, black will play h6 and g5 and go for counterplay. Well, Yusupov uh, hadn't realized that. They were still working out the subtleties. So um, castles. And then here, Doretsky uh, hit him with an idea that he knew from the, from the 1940s or some great games, yeah. which was e3. And the idea is that after bishop f4, you take on f4. And um, um, you've actually got this um, um, this uh, uh, open file um, against the e6 pawn. And of course, you know, the difference in the structures is that if black plays the knight to e4 later, then white can just play f3 later and chase away the knight. And you always get pressure on the open e file. Um, and I actually had a game, uh, a very similar idea. I got this against uh, um, the uh, Russian player and... Um, uh, Sergei Volkov. Uh, I got a very similar structure against Sergei Volkov in uh, in this Oslo tournament I was talking about, and um, uh, very very strong. So he caught him out in that, and then you know later they refined it. And what Terry has done here, um, of course, is um, it hasn't been quite the same, but he's gone for the same thing. He's got the open file um, against a backward e pawn, and yeah. I cannot block it with pieces because the the pawn f three is. Uh, is going to be there. So I would say this is strategically winning for uh, for White now. I mean, th this is the world's worst bishop. This truly is the world's worst bishop I have ever seen. So, um, and in actual fact, um, I mean, how will White uh, do it? There's loads of possibilities. You could go along the A file. Um, you could um, maybe even just line up against the E pawn. I'm not quite sure that um, that um, that uh, um, Black can hold it. You've also got very powerful threats against the King side because Black's played this move H6 and uh, G6 is weak. I mean, um, uh, um, a move like um, Knight H4 and then G4, you know, and to put the King on H2 and the Rook on G1. I mean, this could be really, really strong. You know, um, it's. Uh, um yeah it's uh oh very nice guitar man yeah terry chapman is it's a really fascinating interview with him um stop play, you stop playing in 88 ah, and the barber can rapid play in 93. a certain teenager oh was that me <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> was, i was a teenager that me i won i won i won barber can rapid play one time <laughs> Um, it, it's around, yeah, that's true, actually. Um, but that'll probably be uh, you. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, actually, Mark. I think, uh, yeah, that that uh, the Stockfish has had a, a number of really terrible bishops against uh, Alpha Zero. That uh, um, it was me. Ah, uh, yeah. When I won, I, I played Bertie Barlow in the last round. In the, um, do you remember the Barbican Center? And they had that. Um, the the really nice uh, like conservatory type room with all the plants there. Oh um, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I remember Bertie Barlow. Oh, I haven't seen him for for a long time actually. But uh, he lives very near yeah. me actually. Yeah. Oh okay. Yes, so, I do see him uh, from time to time in the town centre. I, I always remember I played him once, and uh, he had next to his board. He had the array of the most beautiful cakes I'd ever seen. <laughs> but, uh, he had three or four of them, and they were oh! I spent the whole game staring at them and uh, wishing that he'd offer me one, but uh, he ate all of them. It was. Uh, it was, uh, oh, but really, uh, I've, I've still got that memory in my head. I must have been very young. I must have been about uh, 11 or 12 or something. It's, uh, I played him many times. He was always, um, uh, I found him tricky when I was, uh, when I was, uh, when I was young, because he played all these strange openings. You know, he was playing the Grob and the uh, St. George, obviously influenced by, by Michael Bassman, who was, uh, you know, yes. absolutely. Uh, in that area, yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, he was really, uh, when I was growing up, Michael Bassman, he was, uh, he had his books he brought out, winning with a St. George, winning with a Grob, the Macho Grob, all that stuff. He influenced an awful lot of players like that. So uh, it's, uh, um, uh, but uh, indeed I had, um, I, I played a number of games against uh, against uh, uh, Bertie like that. It's, um, 
Uh, let's have a look. Um, what else have we got here? So um, Michael uh, Douglas Michael, uh, Terry Chapman, playing very impressively, I have to say. Really showing some uh, some excellent uh, excellent play there. Uh, what about the Tim Kett game and Clive Frostick? Indeed, I was I'm for uh, great mind like here. So um, we have uh, yeah, I mean uh, again, it's happened a little bit as we thought. Uh, Knight coming around to f four. Uh, Black's played uh, uh, a, a major piece to the um, uh, to the um, uh, B file just to uh, stimulate this one. Might give Black C four at some stage and Rook f eight. Um, again, I, I do think you're sort of struggling with black to uh, to make anything of this. Um, what would I do with white here? I would probably, I'd be definitely be thinking about playing uh, rookie five, rookie five, rookie one. That feels uh, very natural. Um, at some stage, you may uh, consider even um, playing uh, g4 to g5. That could actually be quite a, a dangerous one. Uh, the one thing you've got to watch out here, um, got to, always got to have a good response to is uh, if black plays c4, because um, after c4, the bishop will have to come back to, might have to come back to f1, and then the knight could come into e4. And uh, if you play g4, that feels a little bit silly. Um, but rook e5, yeah, that's a very natural move. Rook e5, rook e1, queen e2, and uh, just let um, uh, black worry about, you know, what, um, yeah, you know, what, what he's going to do about that. Um, I suppose... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, should we bring up a little analysis diagram? Let's have a little look there. We. Um, the one thing that you're thinking about for um, uh, black here, well, two things, I suppose. One is, can I go C4 and do something uh, uh, tactical and crazy? Um, could I play a move like Queen D6, Queen C7? Um, and if you play rookie one, throw something in like Knight E4 to confuse. You know, those are the two... Uh, 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 both of them look quite fraught for black, I have to say. Um, so uh, let's have, let's just have a look at um, oh, let's have a look at queen d6 first. So um, I mean, I could play uh, rook g5 um, or something like that. Um, that isn't stupid at all, um, but I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure what uh, whether you're really going to get any sort of attack there. Um, rook there, the rooks vaguely okay placed but um it could just end up being a little bit out of um uh out of the out of the way there so rookie five rook d1 is what i'd really you know would really expect um so let's have a look knight e4 can we do anything uh, crazy there not really i mean i go bishop takes e4 and if queen e5 there's bishop h7 check so that's not really working so nothing much happening there um could i just neutralize with a move like bishop d7 um that is possible actually um because i can't really do anything like knight d5 i mean uh, we've just got uh, too much pressure along here and rook e8 i just go rook e8 uh that might be that so might just all swap off to a draw it could all be but we're gonna we're gonna try and find something uh something better than that aren't we um I'm not sure there. <laughs> I'm not sure there is. I'm sort of. Uh, I'm lacking inspiration. I have to say uh, in this position. Um, yeah. No, it doesn't look very exciting. I think. Uh, I mean, I think uh, probably rook g five would be the one if you were um, if you were looking for a, a win there. But um, I mean, for example, h six. Um, I don't really think that there's anything anything amazing that you can do here, really. Um, Nothing, no sacks. And Rook G3, this looks at, looking a little bit out of the way. Um, I mean, you might go, you might just go Bishop D7 or something. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think uh, the most likely uh, thing will be to, uh, that we'll get uh, both Rooks on the E file and they'll be, uh, and they'll be exchanged in, um, in this way, I think. So um, I would expect a, a, a draw to be, uh, uh, to be the most likely result here. Should we check on Speed Elephant? Speed elephant. Absolutely. Speed elephant against Flimplam76. Whoa! What is happening here? Speed elephant is a um, uh, a piece up, but getting mated, unfortunately. <laughs> because we've got, we got queen c8 check, king d6, and then knight f5 is going to be checkmate. Oh gosh! So um, uh, that looks like uh, yeah, it looks the like there was the 
end of the road for uh, for speed elephant it's uh well done well done white nice uh, finishing attack there so uh um let's have a look at spud lover what's happened there because we got uh, we we got started on uh, lots of tactics and then uh, we didn't see what happened uh, so white actually played um b4 to b5 and black's played rook c8 oh i'm a little bit um getting a little bit nervous here for white um because uh we've got this rook coming in c2 we've got d5 as a possibility um that is a little bit nerve-wracking but could we um yeah also yeah this king on h2 is good in a way because it stops a lot of tricks um it is however uh, going to be on the line of uh of the bishop if you ever go um uh takes takes so um it's it's, it's a very sharp position of course um Uh, what would I want to do here? I think I'd really want my natural inclination would be to play a move like Bishop D two and um, uh, and maybe maybe just try and neutralize this because I, I think this is going to be uh, um, a little bit annoying. Uh, this will come at an inconvenient moment if you don't uh, deal with it. Um, but there are, I mean, there are this. Uh, um, I could go Rook B two, but it feels weird um, leaving a bishop like this on, on the C file. Uh, um, I just don't like the C file, really. I mean, I, I don't think I would have mm. played B4 to B5 to open up the C file like that. Well, I've still got uh, chances, you know. I mean, there, there is uh, stuff with uh, there and there, but uh, I'm getting a bit nervous about it. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one. Uh, and uh, not much time, and still a very complicated position. Oh, Spud Love right. is great. Rob Wilmot, uh, shall we have a look at Rob? 95. Ah, Rob, 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 indeed. Oh, so what have we got here? Um, interesting position. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Rob gave up his light squared bishop there. Um, a double-edged decision, um, giving white the two bishops. Um, White's got some dark squared weaknesses, but uh, obviously um, black's got quite a few empty light squares there. So uh, double-edged decision there from Rob. Let's see how that turned out. Oh, uh, quite a brave decision there from uh, David Walker, but... Bringing the rook to d1 to stop the knight getting into d5. g6, bishop b2, Ooh, king g8, yeah. f1. Okay, so um, uh, quite a, a few dangerous diagonals there. Rook e8 was played by Rob. Hmm, rook e8. Bishop c4. Well, on bishop c4, let's bring up a, an analysis diagram there. Um, so on uh, bishop c4 uh, we're going to play king f8 i think that's the idea um i'm just trying to work out why um uh why rob didn't play um rook, rook d8 ah okay maybe he was afraid of uh of rook takes and if rook takes then um rook a7 yeah he might have been afraid of that and rook d8 uh, bishop d8 maybe looks a little bit awkward um i'm just wondering about that because after rook e8 um we could play bishop b5 simply which you know would kind of might force the same thing, but you just have an extra yeah. tempo. So ah, but maybe uh, this could be very clever. Because then this track checks on the back rank. Yeah, maybe the idea would be to take take uh, rook a seven and you go rook d one. Uh, that forces bishop f one. Yeah. And then you go maybe a knight d five or something. Um. That could be a a, a very subtle clever move there. Um, I think bishop c4, king f8. Um, it looks a little bit uncomfortable for for, for black, but um, I don't think I don't think it's too bad to be honest. Um, simply because we've got these weak these yeah. weak pawns, and uh, um, I think you know if you go b5, for example, um, I could probably go knight to g4. Would this be possible? Bishop d4, bishop f6, for example something like this or maybe rook d8 first um a6 port a7 pawn is hanging still quite sharp but i think uh i'd expect black to be doing uh to be doing okay here I i'm sure uh somewhere white will play b5 and try and uh um maybe play bishop c4 check yeah. here and, and b5 maybe i think this would maybe be the most natural tie down this pawn um stop the knight coming to d5 and maybe follow up with bishop d4 before, before black yeah. bishop c5 it's a slight edge no it must be a slight edge for white this uh 
Um, so Rob, a, li a little bit under pressure there. Um, uh, oh, just seen that uh, uh, this game was a, a draw. Uh, which one's this? Uh, City Fat Cat uh, drew. We thought ah, might yes. have so a few problems with the, the under two thousand, wasn't it? Thought might have a problem with the deep horn, uh, but managed to uh, to hold that. Um, Hamachua. Um, oh, now Hamachua. That was a, a slight edge for White, but Black has actually played this quite nicely. Um, got both rooks um, on the B and C files. Managed to get this B five break. Um, so I mean, White really now. Um, I think has to play a move like uh, knight takes b5 here. It will take, um, and then we will, um, uh, indeed, we will take on b5, um, takes, rook takes. White's got to pass b pawn, but it's going to be tough to uh, to advance that one uh, much further. And black's got quite nice play. I mean, black will play, if black can get in uh, after bishop b5, can get in d5 and e6 block the light squared bishop, then it's going to be very tough for um, for white to make anything of this. So, um, yeah, rook b5 will be the move. And then black will aim for uh, for d5 and e6. And then, yeah, it's a bit it's a bit tough. If the, if the white bishop then moves, you know, off this diagonal to try and force through the pawn, then the, the black knight comes to e4 and a rook can come to the second rank and attack f2. So, in general, black's, uh, black's absolutely fine in this position, I think. Um, let's have a look at the top board. Um, oh, well, uh, Pete Len against David Bray. Um, why it was oh, another rook and pawn ending, another rook and pawn, ending. and this is a very good one for uh, for black indeed. It's it's completely winning, I think. Uh, um, f5 check chases the king away from e4, and then the black king is going to come to d5, and then we'll chase away the, the, the king again, and then come in with the king as well. So, um this is going to be a winning rook ending for uh, for black here. King d5 is going to be next. And, um, and uh, yeah, uh, it's just uh, white is not... Maybe white top. should try and um, counterattack somehow against those kingside pawns and just bring the king in the other way, like f4. It's going to be a toughie. Um, yeah, you could have played king f4, but um, uh, this c pawn is very fast. I mean, uh, yeah. king d5, d4, c3. Yeah, it looks, it looks um, very scary. Yeah, no, it looks like um, looks like Black here is uh, is going to be coming in with a um, uh, with a um, yeah, it's just going to be a winning pawn, rook and pawn ending there. So, um, oh, Tim Kett was not uh, looking for uh, a uh, the exchange of pieces. He's going for uh, um, trying to liven it up with uh, with a c four there. Um, I was actually wondering. No, uh, yeah, that's right. That's uh, so c four. So. Uh, Okay, so uh, getting a little bit sharper there. Just uh, black, obviously the top seed, or one of the top seeds, trying to make sure that um, um, that uh, that there's uh, some life uh, uh, remains in the uh, in the position there. Uh, Rob likes defending and inching forwards. He won't be in a rush. No, indeed, he's a solid player, Rob. Um, now, what have we got here? So Douglas Michael against Hideous Hog. So, um, yeah, looking very, very good here, uh, still for uh, Douglas Michael. Um, yeah, um, it's one of those positions that so, looks so good that you sort of wonder, what on earth can I do? <laughs> <laughs> Anything I do would um, would make it worse. I think, um, um, actually, Queen C7 would actually uh, just win a pawn, I think. Uh, I don't think you can defend uh, this one. Uh, that's possible. Um uh, obviously, uh, uh, Queen B8 is another move. Um, just looking to uh, to line up with the eighth rank and tie Black down. Um, what else could I do here? The funny thing is, is that this Bishop on D3, it's a, a perfect, uh, a perfect. Oh, good lord! Can you hear me still? Yes. Can you hear me still? Uh... Yes, I can hear you. Still. Okay, sorry, I, I knocked the uh, the button on my microphone. So, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a good position that um, this bishop is great, but actually, it doesn't have the entry points because everything's on light squares. But um, yeah, I think queen c seven would pick up a pawn, and once this one goes, then b five will go as well. So I think that would be a very good uh, a very good way to play. Um, nice positional game from uh, from white there uh what else have we got here um aaron rich against uh finn uh time for biscuit natasha 
Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. Which rich tea. haven't we done? Well, I, yeah, we've done the rich tea. I was thinking, actually, sometimes Chris Rice watches our stream. Uh, <laughs> so I actually have some lightly salted Chris Rice cakes. Um, Fantastic. Very nice. And then also some um, Leibkuchen Hartstons. Oh, very good. Try and get that on there. Very good. Shot. There we go. Um, and because we've been watching a bit of the women's tournament, uh, we also oh, I've got loads of them. I do. I've got loads more in here actually. Um, but um, actually, in the uh, a woman in the open tournament is um, Kit Katarzyna Toma. <laughs> Kit <laughs> and um, Mad Alien, a bon maman Madeline. Oh my goodness! Indeed. Madeline. Yeah, we both we both thought that uh, that it was Madeline, that it was maybe the do that, uh, the name of her daughter, but it was actually uh, Madeline. That's Dag Dagny, isn't it? Dagny's just. I'm coming to the end of my biscuits here, but there's another three. Um, then uh, we could have. Um, I don't think he's playing in this tournament, but Flapjack Rudd. <laughs> Flapjack Rudd. Rudd. Uh, also, um, a great American player, attacking player, was uh, Walter Twenty Brownie Bites. Walter Brown. And the last one was Neil Carr's Table Water Biscuits. My goodness me. So there My we go. Passion. That'll keep me, uh, get me full up. <laughs> now, oh, incredible. Let nobody um, say that you're sometimes uh, slightly obsessive with uh, <laughs> with uh, with ideas. It's um, uh, basic. So what's happening here? This is uh, Aaron Rich T against... Uh, the thin biscuits. Um, we've got um, so so. Uh, Bishop H six was just played to defend G seven. Um, yeah, I mean both sides have got problems with their seventh rank and um, <laughs> flapjack rub. Yes, uh, that's, that's a really classic one. That is, I think that's a really good one. It's um, actually flapjack. Oh, mm, I love flapjack. Yeah, they are it. nice. I, my mum makes incredible flapjack. That's really uh, that really is. Uh, mm. I had never thought of flapjack rod. <laughs> really good. <laughs> um, so, what a uh, rook takes b7. What is black going to do here? Um, uh, I mean, rook c4 is a possibility here because if we go rook a7, we've got rook b2. Very baldies. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking geary baldy as well. Yeah, uh, yes. I, I, I went to the shop specifically to get the garibaldis, but there weren't any in stock today, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, let's have a look. What is black going to do? What is white going to do here? So, uh, rook c4, he's played it. Um, I guess we should move the bishop out. I mean, it should really be ending in a draw somehow, but, um, you could have also... Have a good sleep, Shivant. Good night. Good night. Um, you could also imagine, um, somebody falling for a, a nasty tactic here. So I'm just trying to discover them. Um, I want to, I want to mate on f8. I want to get a bishop on a3 and, uh, and, uh, but... I, uh, it's not really happening, is it? I mean, you just you just take on a two, then would you really would you really have anything? Well, maybe go rook a seven, threatening rook b eight. It's just uh, yeah. quick, quick, quick analysis diagram just to uh, to find some nice way of uh, self mating. Um, so uh, bishop a three, I think that's a reasonable one. Um, then let's just say we go um, rook c rook a two. Um, so rook b8, king f7 would not be would not work. Let's go rook a7, keeping the king in check. And we're threatening rook b8. So what could we do about that? Well, probably just the boring rook c8. Uh, it's just going to be, it will end up as a draw, this one, I think. Just uh, everything swapped off. Uh, it does look Jewish, doesn't it? We go bishop c5 and uh, uncover it, and uh, we're going to be fine. So uh, uh, Hamachua uh, against Coventry, they agreed a draw. The pawn's got okay. uh, swapped off there. So, uh, um, uh, Terry still thinking here, taking, investing some time, just, uh, trying to work out what to do here. I think queen c7 really is very strong here. Um, because queen takes rook takes, you just can't defend the pawn. I can't work out how to, how to defend everything there. So, uh, I think that will just, that would just be completely winning. Um, let's have a look. So, um, 
Uh, okay, so a6 was played. Uh, White played the cautious uh, h3 to stop knight g4. Um, and Rob took the opportunity to play a6, which was probably a good move. Takes takes rook a1. So um, pieces being swapped off there. Now, I think that um, probably rook a1, you, you, you'd allow knight d5. So bishop a1 is indeed probably a better move here. But I think that uh, Black could just play rook d8 here. And uh, I mean, I do suspect that he's not that Black isn't going to have is going to be able to hold this quite um, uh, quite satisfactorily, really. Um, it's uh, White does have the two bishops, but um, but there's some some weaknesses, uh, you know, here as well, and uh, and the knight will be quite well placed on d5. So um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would rather be probably slightly prefer to be White there, but but still. Um, any games that we haven't seen yet that you think might be? Uh... Yeah, I, well, I just I think we're just too late for um, Philip Mabry against Julian Shepley, which is is a oh. um, it's a white win, um, okay. and uh, and that was turned into two rooks against two knights at the end. And board in flames, which is Remy, I haven't been able to see, so I guess that must be over two. Um, well, no, I've got it. I've got it. Oh, have you? It's board in flames. Board in flame, flame, flame. Ah, that's what I was doing wrong. Okay, yes, yes. That's so, uh, oh, what's this one? So, um, how many? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. So, White has two pawns for the exchange. Um, who is better and why? Um, well, I mean, in general, in these positions, um, I always tend to assume that the exchange must be slightly better when there's rooks on the board. Anyway, um, actually, um, in this case. Um, but um, in, uh, in actual fact, uh, uh, <laughs> very good. Jelly. <laughs> oh my goodness me! Oh dear, jelly rolls. Baked e Lasker. That is incredible. What a good one. Oh, guitar man, genius. It's uh, actually I'm going to I'm going to save the chat. I think because we've got too many uh, too many good ones here. We have to uh, we'll have to bring them out all the time. Um, so um, actually, uh, um, um, the engines are absolutely incredible in holding these um, positions where you know one side's got two or three pawns even to the exchange, um, and uh, um, uh, and this one um, I think would, uh, but this one with split pawns I think is always if they're split pawns, the two rooks always seem to manage to generate a fair amount of counterplay there, and uh, um, I'm thinking, yeah, what is White going to do here? <coughs> Um, I think White really wants to, would ideally want to keep the rooks on. Um, um, also, with with split pawns, you know, if if you don't have a rook on the board, then the opponent's rook can move from side to side and uh, um, an attack. And it's not very easy for White to create connected pass pawns, you know, which again is the uh, the thing that um, could really tie down a rook. Um, I mean, um, uh, so something like rook d three is natural. I mean, you could. Um, so moot point, you know, you could at some stage you're going to consider taking on c4, I think, uh, as black. Um, but for the moment, I think you'd maybe play something like rook e4 afterwards. Uh, this should be, uh, I would expect this to uh, to end up as a draw, really. But, uh, um, but you know, if white gets it, um, if uh, black gets it a little bit wrong, then um, you could, um, you know, you could end up losing a pawn somewhere. But in principle, this should be a draw. Um, Spudlover, how is this going against Frank Keeley? Brian Gosling. Um, ooh, ooh, this is uh, getting uh, interesting. So, um, well, White hasn't really got uh, the pieces developed. Um, there is a bit of a weakness of the king, but there's a big trick coming up. Uh, oh, um, because um, what could happen here, it looks um, after g takes f4 that White is just winning with queen takes. But there is a trick, Natasha. Oh, sorry, I was, I was looking for <laughs> the, your next game for you. Uh, let me see. Sorry, uh, white to play is it? No, black to play. Black, black to play. To sorry, play. I've been. Um, I hadn't realised you were you were looking for more games. It's um, it's a bit of a sneaky tactic here for black. Uh, right, it's going to end up in some knight fork on f three or something like that. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's um, knight f three check. And if uh, king h1, of course, h3 is hanging to the queen, yeah. but king g2 allows knight h4. Queen h3, check. oh, knight h4. 
Um, so, um, so that's rather so you can't take on g6. So that is actually rather um, rather annoying for uh, my daughters for my... are now laughing at my big pile of biscuits I've got by the machine. <laughs> they will, of course, be helping me eat them all later. Indeed. Um, ah, yeah, this is going to be quite awkward for White, I think. Um, because I mean, we're threatening f3 and bishop e5 check, so in principle, I, I really ugh, I'm a bit nervous for uh, for Spud Lover there. But of course, Frank uh, Black is very short on time. Look at that 41 seconds. Wow. Uh, and plays queen f5, which I think is also a pretty a pretty good move um, because um, uh, if we go queen g5, then we've got a knight f3 check fork again. And um, f takes g, we've got a bishop e5 check, which, um, uh, again, I mean, black is superbly active there. So, um, uh, well, actually, probably even queen e5 check is even stronger. So, um, uh, I, in general, uh, um, I do like black's position here. Um, but obviously, black is quite short of time, so that's going to be a bit of a thrilling one there. Um, Aaron Rich. Oh, good Lord, Aaron Rich has lost white. Oh, white fell for the trick. Oh, dear. After rook 8, c4, white took on a7. And rook takes b2 happened with rook b2, rook c1. Uh, so, um, oh, gosh. So, uh, so it looks like... Uh, the end. No, so it looks like the end of, the end of the biscuit pack for uh, for Aaron Rich there. <laughs> so, um, um, and uh, what's happened with uh, Rob? Ah, yes, indeed. So uh, this is going to be a draw. Uh, David Walk against uh, Rob Wilmot. Nothing to be done in this position. Uh, oh, good lord! Um, and uh, um, uh, let's have a look. We've got uh, um, what else have we got? Uh, indeed, um, white played rook eight, rook eight, king two, queen d seven. There. Um, so um, I would expect that uh, uh, rook a seven here would be the move to play for white, and uh, you are going to pick up a pawn somehow. Um, although, yeah, I mean, black putting up a great defense here. It's not. Uh, it's it's going to be. Uh, it's going to take a little while to uh, to win this one. Uh, our queen e five. Um, well, I think uh, you know white can play around for quite a while here. I think at some stage, a g four break is going to be the one that um, that opens things up. I just the most. This is the most lovely chess dot com name. Uh, unfortunately, I think the game's over. But uh, I was looking at. Um, uh, Charlie Ball, and his his name is Owlet of Doom. <laughs> Just so nice, uh, but I think the game the game I wasn't getting anything, so I think it must be finished. I don't know if he won or not um, against Sharon Merchant. I'm looking for for some games still going in the 1400s. It's uh, actually um, we we're going to need to wind up fairly soon anyway, aren't we? Because we're we're back on again in under an hour. So indeed. So um, it's nearly quarter to um, to to six UK time. So what we're going to do? We are going to uh, wind up here now that um, most of the games have uh, have finished, and then we are going to be back. We're going to have a grab a quick spot of uh, a dinner, and then we will be back at um, uh, eighteen fifty for the um, second round of the uh, championship, um, uh, the open uh, uh, championship uh, featuring Michael Adams. Um, yes, well, indeed. Some, some really good games, uh, promising games there tonight. There's uh, Michael Adams is playing William Claridge Hanson. I don't know if anyone tuned in last night, but uh, William played a fantastic um, attacking game yesterday. And so he... Is rewarded with a game against um, Michael Adams, and then on board two, Katajima Toma against Matthew Turner. Uh, so again, it uh, looks like a very exciting encounter. Indeed, and just look at our qualifiers. We've got uh, Hack Attack Thomas Villiers, Black yes. against Matthew Wadsworth, and we've got Peter Finn taking on Bogdan Lalic. Yes, so, um... lots of lots of lots of. Uh, exciting games to look forward to. So hopefully mm -hmm. you can join us in just about an hour's time um, and uh, we'll be covering the games from the championship. Sult Sultana can raising cookies. Just... 
<laughs> oh, dear. these are really good. These are really, really good. <laughs> it's uh, uh, fantastic. Thanks so much for everyone for all their um, all their help and all their uh, all their comments. Um, we will be back right back in in uh, just over an hour um, to cover the championship. So hopefully, see you there. Um, thanks very much indeed, guys. See you later. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.